I think generally the task of, you know, breaking down or demystifying the way powerful institutions operate is important. And I think it's essential in affecting change. Pretty significant need for um, a massive shift in sort of political education of the journalism profession. My sense is that it's rare for um, the exposure, even of outrageous corporate behavior, to result in swift changes. What if we didn't do it this way? And what if, uh, what if we centered the voices who are traditionally excluded from this model of coverage? I mean, if like across the country, you know, like mechanics were just like ruining cars every day, and then like going to conferences where they like talked about, you know, how strong, like, you know, the mechanics profession is, like everyone would think that was really weird. And yet, you know, in most sort of elite legal circles, that's tolerated. You still need organizing on the ground. You still need community buy-in. The sort of for-profit media model uh, re uh, gives platforms to people who reify the status quo and to publications that broadly do the same thing. And I think the role of journalism is really, um, it's, it's tilling the soil, it's preparing people's minds, it's, it's changing some basic attitudes, perceptions, and beliefs, on top of which things like organizing can occur. Even when we're working to put out what, what I view as like important perspectives and narratives that correct the, the failings of establishment media. We are unable to divorce that from, to a certain extent from like the, the way corporate power dominates the industry. It's also extremely easy to become captured by your uh, employer's interest and you may think that you're built differently, built to resist corporate culture, and maybe you are, but also you're probably just human and who knows, you might be as susceptible as the rest of us. In general, there's just like a whole world to report on. Um, and as Alec and others have discussed, um, you know, the huge media organizations are, are missing so much and missing so many important angles of, of really crucial issues. So there's there's definitely no um, no lacking sort of for, for opportunity to, to do some cool reporting. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back. Um, my name is Saleh, and I will be introducing our first speaker for our roundtable today. So our first speaker is Vanessa A. B. By day, Vanessa is a consumer protection lawyer for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. By night, or whenever, whatever time she chooses to write, she writes about inequality, corporate power, the American left, and Washington, D.C. Her work can be seen in The Intercept, The New Republic, New York Magazine, Current Affairs, Guarnerica Magazine, and more. Her forthcoming memoir is tentatively titled Homebound, reflecting her childhood experience across three continents. Please keep a lookout for it in fall of 2022. And please join me in welcoming Vanessa A.B. Hi, everyone. I'm Lucy. I'm introducing Alec Karakatsanis. Um, so uh, Alec is the executive director and founder of Civil Rights Corps. Um, he was also, before that, a public, defend um, a public defender with the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. Um, and he was later a federal public defender in Alabama. Um, He's received many awards, um, including a 2016 Trial Lawyer of the Year from Public Justice and for his work at Civil Rights Corps challenging the money bail system. Alex is a graduate of Harvard Law School and he was a member of the Harvard Law Review. Um, most recently, he was the author of the book Usual Cruelty, which is fantastic. Um, he is very generous with students interested in uh, systemic injustices and he's um, spoken at the law school many times. Um, on a personal note, I admired Alec for a really long time before coming to law school, and he um, also recently very generously offered to um, promote something that I wrote with his massive following. So um, he's just very, very dedicated to law students and helping us um, with our careers. So thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam, and I'm honored to introduce a different Sam, the greater Sam, Sam Rosen. Um, you can read his bio. Um, he's a freelance journalist, and he's also clerking right now. Um, but I know Sam because he was my TF for torts last year. Um, and I know from that experience that he is just the most warm, thoughtful, and considerate person. And he brings that energy to everything he does. Um, so we're really grateful to have him here today. He's been an asset to our development of the flaw and will continue to be moving forward. Um, and really looking forward to hearing all the insight he's going to bring to our conversation. 
Hi, my name is Tala, and I am very pleased to be able to introduce Jay Willis. Um, so Jay is currently the editor-in-chief of Balls and Strikes, which is a site for critical progressive legal commentary, um, and in my opinion, one of the very few tolerable legal commentary sites. Um, his writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, SF Gate, the good version of Deadspin, and many more. Um, and Jay has previously practiced law in Washington, DC and Seattle, and he is also a Harvard Law alum. Um, and although he's currently more so on the media side of things, according to his Twitter bio, he will be your lawyer for the right price in parentheses of 1 million cash in a briefcase. Um, so thank you, Jay, for being with us today. Hi, everyone. My name is Arik. I'm going to be moderating this legendary panel of advocates, activists, lawyers. Um, and thank you for coming and um, giving us a window into your experiences and also letting a probably very underqualified 1L grill you about them. Um, to sort of start off with, um, the simple fact that, you know, you all have law degrees and yet pursue such various forms of advocacy, particularly long form journalism, but also magazine writing, book writing, memoirs, et cetera, I think points to the importance of advocacy beyond the courtroom. And I was wondering, and maybe Vanessa, if I can start with you, uh, if you could speak to how you came to realize journalism as being part or an important part of your theory of change, and particularly how your legal education has intersected or has intersected with or informed that approach. Um, hi, thank you all for having me. And apologies in advance if you hear a baby screaming in the background. That's my two months old. Um, so I, yeah, I, I felt a little bit limited um, in what I wanted to say, um, you know, just through lawyering. I think working for the federal government, I, you know, put on my government hat and I'm almost, you know, acting, well, I'm definitely not acting in my own person. I'm just like a cog in the machine. And so that sort of limits me in what I can say and can't say. And so journalism was an outlet for me to look into things that were of interest to me that I thought were um, important to write about. Um, and yeah, so writing provided that outlet. Um, I think generally the task of, you know, breaking down or demystifying the way powerful institutions operate is important. And I think it's essential in affecting change um, insofar as people can't seek accountability or fight for something different without being armed with the facts. That said, um, you know, I'm like a little pessimistic about the amount of change that just raising awareness can bring about on its own, which a lot of journalism is. Uh, just as I'm skeptical about the extent to which the law itself can do the same again on its own. My sense is that it's rare for um, the exposure, even of outrageous corporate behavior to result in swift changes. You still need organizing on the ground. You still need community buy-in. You still need like a sustained interest from lots of parties in continuing to attack whatever issue we're talking about with a variety of tools. and reporting and litigation can be in that toolbox, but I think it's it's uh, healthy to manage one's expectations about how much you can accomplish and also manage one's, you know, sense of um, kind of like self-importance <laughs> about your role in affecting change, um, if, if that makes sense. So all of this is to say that I occasionally pursue reporting, but I think it's important to be kind of humble about how far that can take you. So it seems that some synthesis of an understanding of the legal system with journalism as a method is extremely important. I was wondering, Alec, if you could speak to maybe the sort of reverse relation in the sense that you've spent a long time sort of with Civil Rights Corps founding it and pointing, uh, pointing your guns at the carceral state and litigating, how do you figure that journalism or other forms of public advocacy inform the way that you advocate within the courtroom. Thanks, Arik. Yeah, it's so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And, and that's a really important question. I think my view on that has changed a little bit. You know, as, as um, I began doing this work, um, I was just happy to sort of um, expose the injustices that we were fighting in our legal cases and try to get reporters to write about them. 
Um, and then as I sort of saw the ways in which reporters were talking about these cases, I realized that there was a pretty significant need for um, a massive shift in sort of political education of the journalism profession. Just like lawyers, I mean, journalists tend to come from very particular backgrounds with their particular views of the world. They exist in a very particular media culture, which is heavily corporatized and, and really, like the law, organized to be in service of people who own things. So it wasn't sufficient just to have journalists write about what was happening in our cases. I think it, was, it, was, it became really clear that what we need to do is fundamentally change how um, the media talks about these issues much more generally. And that has led over the course of recent years to a much more uh, formal, more institutionalized approach that I myself take and that we take at Civil Rights Corps to try to educate journalists, try to politically engage journalists, try to activate them, try to make them aware of some of the biases and systemic flaws in, in the, both the sort of newsroom structure and in sort of how they're thinking about their own storytelling. Um, and that has led some of us recently to start something called the Center for Just Journalism, which is going to hopefully be an intervention that tries to um, change the way the entire media ecosystem talks about things like harm and safety and violence and wellness and human flourishing more generally. Um, because I think the, the narrow conception of safety that dominates media discussion of these issues is quite harmful and, and quite um, useful to people who profit off of and, and want to perpetuate the criminal punishment bureaucracy. So for me, over the course of my career, I've really um, come to adopt a different and maybe more, both at the same time, more adversarial, but also more intimate and more connected relationship with journalists, rather than as just an advocate who's trying to get journalists to write about the things that we're doing. I really see intervening in journalism as quite important. Like Vanessa said, I don't think it's by any means sufficient. Simply raising awareness about these issues is never going to change them. And so we have to think just like with the law and lawyers, we have to think about what role does journalism, does the media, does the narratives around us, do the myths, the myths that the system creates, you know, the, what role can that play in a broader social movement to change the balance of power in our society? And I think the role of journalism is really, um, it's, it's tilling the soil, it's preparing people's minds, it's, it's changing some basic attitudes, perceptions, and beliefs, on top of which things like organizing can occur. And so I think to do this work effectively, you kind of have to have a theory for how the public narrative work that you do in, in journalism intersects with people that are leading social movements that are actually going to change the fundamental balances of power in our society. Right. And I think that systemic view of journalism and conceiving of journalists as crafted by a very corporate environment is really, really key. And sort of thinking more about journalism as a from, from a bird's eye perspective, you know, Jay, you decided to start your own sort of platform, uh, Balls and Strikes. I guess one question for you would be, how do you view the sort of journalism slash legal landscape and see your, and see Balls and Strikes as in certain, inserting your own or a different voice within that wider, wider universe? Yeah, thanks for the question. And thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this great event. I think the the impetus for balls and strikes comes out of just like decades, right, of looking at a legal media landscape that covers not just the Supreme Court, but the legal system in general, with sort of like this very, in my view, credulous perspective of it as conferring legitimacy on outcomes that if you're not a lawyer, right, you look at a lot of these outcomes and you're like, wait, what? That's terrible. How is how is a court blessing this? How is a judge blessing this? How is a legal system allowing this sort of <laughs> just like manifest uh, uh, amoral outcome? Uh, how is it holding it up? Um, so the theory behind balls and strikes is evaluating the legal system's output based on how it affects people who like aren't Ivy League lawyers, no offense to anyone in the room, stuff like that, right? Like. This, this stuff isn't academic. This stuff is academic to many of the people who cover the court, who write about the court, and I'm speaking here about, <clears throat> pardon me, both journalists and legal media. Um, but it's not to the people whose whose lives are fundamentally changed by what the Supreme Court does, what a federal court of appeals, um, you know, whose decisions control in half a dozen states does. Uh, 
So I think it's important to, to take a step back from sort of that institutional bias towards treating the system as inherently legitimate and approaching it from a perspective of what if we didn't do it this way? And what if, uh, what if we centered the voices who are traditionally excluded from this model of coverage? So it seems that a running theme across what we've been talking about is the sense of like institutional bias, the sense of, you know, ways to justify the systems that we are in. Um, and one of those, one of the sources of that bias, as Alec and I think Jay alluded to, is corporate power. And a lot of us here are taking courses with Professor Hansen, with other professors, on interrogating corporate power. And I was wondering if one of you, maybe Sam, could speak to how corporate power influences your work, how it pre presents challenges and opportunities, or how, and how you deal with those within your wider advocacy. Gosh, well, I think I, I sort of have um, two responses to that. First, I'll say I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here with everyone. So thanks for having me. I think um, there, my two answers are relate to sort of um, how I experienced that as a law student and then how I experienced that as a freelancer. I think um, a lot of what uh, Jay just said um, resonated so much because my experience, like I imagine a lot of people's experience in law school um, was um, this sort of dissonance uh, of, on the one hand, trying really hard to kind of learn a language that um, this sort of community of elite lawyers, um, you know, speak in America, um, while on the other hand, sort of seeing in all of these different ways how um, to the sort of people outside of that community, that language is just sort of nonsensical um, and and the structures sort of don't do what the what the experts say they do. And I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I feel like that is even more pronounced in the law um, than it is in other areas of expertise. I mean, if like across the country, you know, like mechanics were just like ruining cars every day and then like going to conferences where they like talked about, you know, how strong like, you know, the mechanics profession is like everyone would think that was really weird. And yet, you know, in most sort of elite legal circles that's tolerated. And so um, where that sort of connects to the power of corporations for me is that, um, you know, I, I learned through Professor Hansen's classes and others that um, these, you know, that that wasn't, you know, an accident, that the reason that law schools were set up like that um, was, you know, in large part due to the influence of corporations in shaping legal education. Um, and then the other thing I'll just say as a freelancer, and this is a really obvious point, um, but I think, you know, the kind of, of journalism that I imagine, you know, everyone on this panel would broadly like to see um, is really expensive and takes a lot of time. Um, and we've seen, um, you know, corporations and, and, you know, individual billionaires sort of squish publications um, that make that kind of work more possible. And then sort of on the flip side, you know, there are publications that sort of, you know, rely on the largesse of, you know, sort of individual billionaires to keep going. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't a lot of people who do amazing work at those publications, despite the sort of awkwardness, um, you know, the tension between sort of the, the content of the work and who's paying the bills. But um, that's all just to say that, um, you know, for me, the sort of power of corporations um, has shaped in a bunch of ways my experience sort of at the intersection of law and journalism. Does anyone else want to speak to that sort of experience? It seems to be a very large sort of obstacle for anybody who wants to do advocacy. Um, does any, would anyone like to contribute their own sort of experiences or maybe even advice as to how to overcome that as an individual advocate? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly true for me, right? Like, Great, I, I'm running like a, a new progressive legal commentary site. Uh, I'm also sponsored by a nonprofit. Like the free market did not, <laughs> did not like give rise to this kind of publication, right? And I think that's a real, a real tension that the, in journalism, that the sort of for-profit media model uh, re, uh, gives 
platforms to people who reify the status quo and to publications that broadly do the same thing. Uh, like another thing I think about often, for example, and I don't know, don't really have a good theory for how to reconcile this yet, is I think about a site like Twitter, right? Which uh, I spend more time on than I probably should. And I suspect I'm not the only one. Um, we've seen like a, like a really promising uh, use for that platform to get out alternative narratives, right? That you might not see Alec, right? In the New York Times' latest, uh, latest terrible crime story. Like you're able to use your platform to, to push back on those and to highlight like the, the carceral biases that are so often inherent in the, in the Times reporting. Um, and, and a lot of people are able to do, are able to contribute that. At the same time, like, Alec, you're not making any money for that, right? Like that, that's go, it's uh, like Twitter's making money for that. Like they're getting more engagement off of that. And of course, like to be clear, this is not suggesting that like we shouldn't be doing that, but like there's not, there's not yet like a real sustainable way for more voices like that to pop up in the same way uh, to in the same way that like it exists in the for-profit media sphere. So I do think about how like even even when we're working to put out what what I view as like important perspectives and narratives that correct the the failings of establishment media that we're still participating. We are unable to divorce that front to a certain extent from like the, the way corporate power dominates the industry. I really like how you pointed out to sort of the individual's ability to personalize their advocacy through platforms like Twitter and stuff like that. Um, it seems that there is sort of this collective action issue in terms of converting your own voice into something much larger, something like a movement or something like um, an advocacy for specific policies with other people. And so I was wondering, how do you sort of, um, how, how do you see one voice coalescing with others to form a larger movement um, just within the sphere of journalism or personal advocacy, if anyone wants to take that? Um, maybe Alex, Alec, as a, as Jay mentioned, your you know vigorous involvement in Twitter. Well, I, I think Vanessa and I are actually working on monetizing our cat photos, so we'll let you know, Jay, if we figure out a way of of making a great deal of money through sharing. I was going to say, let, please follow up. Let's talk after this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's a really hard question. Um, I think. Um, Twitter is not, um, or, or any other form of public communication is just not successful when it's divorced from a broad base um, like movement. And so almost everything I do on Twitter is very particular and very strategic. Um, and then most of it is, is um, done in coordination with people who are working on very particular campaigns in particular cities who um, want some kind of intervention to be made in the media narrative around whatever particular thing is going on, whether it's bail reform or the way the media is talking about policing in the context of a police budget fight or the sort of broader way the national media is, is um, concocting this panic about so-called crime. Um, I, I say so-called crime because obviously they're only concerned with some crimes committed by some people in some places. Um, but then I think more perniciously linking this fear about you know, this vague concept of crime to police and to carceral intervention, um, which is, you know, I think the equivalent of, of climate science denial, right? Um, and so this, this constant link between, between like carceral and punishment interventions and um, crime is a pervasive flaw in the national and local coverage all over the place. But commenting on that on Twitter or, or you know, planting good stories like that or doing op-eds on it as an individual is not a very effective way of pushing back. Um, we need to be doing a, a many different types of strategies. And those strategies include, but are not limited to, um, direct in individual engagement with journalists behind the scenes, political education and training for journalists, awareness raising about how 
the harm they're causing, um, campaigns to try to change and organize newsroom so that um, newsroom staff can, can obtain more power, either as a union or some other form of organization. Um, there's a lot of affinity groups of journalists that are now organizing, but taking back some of the power over decision-making from the corporate sort of um, element and profit-seeking element of news, um, organizing directly impacted people and survivors of police and state violence um, to speak out about the harms that journalists are causing them, sort of raising the level of, of broad-based accountability for bad journalism. Um, these are all strategies, right, that we're doing together. We're doing them in conjunction with campaigns. We're doing them in conjunction with organizers. And I think it's that combination that actually enables a Twitter thread or an op-ed um, to have a little bit more actual, tangible impact in the world. And so all, none of us should be thinking about our Twitter platform as you know, raising our own personal brand or like um, just you know, venting about how bad a particular article is. It has to be done as part of a coherent long-term strategy that you're doing in concert with many, many other people and comrades who are thinking about these things and each doing their own intervention as part of a greater whole. Yeah, I really like the emphasis in sort of a multi-pronged approach. And so again, this whole systemic view of advocacy um, comes up. I was wondering, speaking of myriad forms of advocacy and tying them to a coherent whole, I mean, Vanessa, I know you've written just a myriad uh, array of, of writings, of pieces from memoirs to op-eds with, dealing with a variety of substantive issues. I was wondering if you could speak to that sort of diversity and how you decide between certain forms of written advocacy over others? Um, I, I like going with outlets who will, um, you, who won't like really restrict me as much with the word count. I like to go in deep. I mean, I have a day job. So if I'm going to be doing writing outside of that, it has to feel like I can you know, that I'm working on something that I can really sink my teeth into and that I can kind of go on at length about. So that factors into who I choose to work with. Um, and as far as like selecting topics, I, you know, I have these broad interests, some of them which you listed, you know, when you introduced me, when I was introduced. Um, I really, I, I, I'm not as singularly focused as Alec. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I have many interests and sometimes something piques my interest or I'm like, well, I hate the way everyone is talking about any trust right now. Like it's this really, um, you know, obscure part of the law when in fact it touches our lives in all these different ways. So I'm going to find a way to basically write a primer in like, really simple terms um, to try to explain it to other people. And, you know, maybe I'll move someone to kind of take it deeper or to, um, I don't know, to sort of think of all the ways in which any trust is like impacting our lives, right? Um, but that the starting point is really like my own, my own interest. And I'm able to just kind of follow where I wanna go in part because my, main source of income isn't journalism. So that gives me some freedom. And just to kind of um, wrap it up, it, I have my own like substantive politics and I'm pretty grounded in them. So that's always in the background of everything I write. And I wouldn't write something that doesn't advance my political beliefs in, in some way. So that's, that's how that usually works out. Yeah, so clearly there's a, a spectrum of approaches from a very pointed um, stance towards spreading your net wide. Um, we only have a few minutes left. And so I guess I was wondering, a lot of you have spoken about juggling this type of advocacy with their you know, lawyer lifestyle or their litigation or whatever interaction they have with the law. Um, and this is a room of law students all interested in justice, all interested in corporate power broadly, as well as utilizing different forms of advocacy. So I was wondering um, for the last few minutes, if anyone could maybe concisely, you know, give a few words of advice as to how we can go about balancing, um, you know, these different forms of persuasion, um, starting from law school and into the real world. Um, I, 
you know, you can always freelance on the side, right? I mean, that's one way to start. Lots of people um, like Jay, for instance, transition to full journalism mid-career. That's also on the table. I will say in terms of like pursuing corporate accountability in the law or public advocacy, I would urge you to think really carefully about what job you take out of law school. You're all super smart. You're all going to have lots of opportunities. Um, but one of the ways in which you can make a meaningful difference is in the first or second or third job that you take out of law school. And I would urge you to be very realistic about the idea of pursuing corporate accountability from within. Uh, I think, sure, it helps to have like justice, consumer minded people in compliance departments and in big law firms, but it's also extremely easy to become captured by your uh, employer's interest. And you may think that you're built differently, built to resist corporate culture, and maybe you are, but also you're probably just human and who knows, you might be as susceptible as the rest of us. So I think some of you will face like a hard choice and like a competitive market, but you know, I'm gonna make my pitch for the public sector. Um, and realistically, you will find that even the good guys have their limits in the work they can do. I see it at my own job all the time. I'm really proud of the work I do, but um, sometimes that means that I get restitution back for consumers for harm that happened to them four years ago. You know, So on the one hand, we're sending a message to the industry, change these practices, be better in the consumer finance world. As to the people who were actually harmed, maybe you get a $5 check four years after you were harmed. And that doesn't feel great, but, me and my colleagues can generally like sort of sleep at night and feel pretty good about what we do. And that's the feeling that I wish on you all. So that is my pitch for public sector work. <laughs> I'm very interested, particularly because Sam, you are right out of law school. Um, like when I emailed you, you were still using your JD21 email, which I found super cool. Um, I was wondering, you know, as somebody fresh out into uh, uh, fresh out of Harvard Law School, the gates are wide open. What were what were your thoughts sort of going in and, and now you pursuing journalism alongside um, whatever legal endeavors you have? Um, what were your thoughts going through that process? You know, I don't have, um, you know, much of a sort of career uh, to reflect on. Um, but I will say um, that for me, um, you know, because of the sort of dissidence um, that I felt sort of about law school journalism, I knew um, sort of going in to my sort of post law school career had to be a part of whatever I was doing so that I could have a balance between sort of being a little bit in and, and a little bit um, outside of the law. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's really, really tricky for all of the reasons we've talked about. I guess maybe I'll echo something that um, Vanessa was just saying, which is that um, especially while, you know, people are trying to do this work um, for, uh, you know, while they're doing another job, um, it's so important to have um, it feel like work that is sustaining and actually feels sort of aligned with your values. Um, and so that might mean, you know, finding, you know, editors um, or publications in places that you wouldn't um, think to look because those are the people who are sort of really going to give your ideas um, attention and care in a way that makes it feel, um, uh, you know, really worthwhile. And then the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, for me, my work is mostly reporting based. It's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of sort of me directly kind of first person in the piece. And I think um, that kind of work, if done, um, you know, with with the right sort of care and attention to your role um, as a reporter can be um, a really wonderful way not only to do work that feels cool and exciting, but also um, just have like a really meaningful conversation with someone that, you know, maybe your day job um, or your social circles, um, you know, don't always bring you in, in contact with, you know, there's a, there are perils to that. And I think reporters need to be really aware of sort of their own subjectivity that they're bringing to that kind of uh, relationship. Um, but I think in general, there's just like a whole world 
to report on. Um, and as Alec and others have discussed, um, you know, the huge media organizations are, are missing so much and missing so many important angles of, of really crucial issues. So there's there's definitely no um, no lacking sort of for, for opportunity to, to do some cool reporting. All right, well, thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause for all our panelists. so much of their time and I think that ends the panel portion.